Okay, we are recording. All right, uh, this will be uh, on the Shul's YouTube channel, uh, hopefully sometime tomorrow or Tuesday. So if uh, you know people who wanted to be here or aren't able to, they should just follow up and uh, um, 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 you know, see it there. Uh, but uh, excited that we're able to participate live. And uh, I actually don't know who is, who's, uh, gonna, who's launching us, who is our, who's our host for tonight? I am. I Great. Am. Okay, thank you. All right, take hey. it away. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Esty. I'm Freda's daughter. And my experience is in the Peace Corps and starting a nonprofit in Paraguay called the Super Kids Foundation, Fundacion Super Niños. Um, and I'm one of the panelists, as well as Yael from Olam uh, and Annie from Carena. I'll let them uh, explain a little bit more about their organizations and how they're involved in Jewish international development in a minute. Um, but first, just some ground rules. Everybody will stay on mute during this call. And if you have a question, uh, feel free to type it in the chat and then we can get to it in the order that you send it. Um, and because this group is very small, I would also say that you can just raise your hand when we get to, when we get to time for questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question to all of the panelists or one of the panelists, uh, whatever you're interested in. Um, so with that, I think we have six to eight minutes for each of the panelists. So I will put on my timer and I will let each panelist know uh, when six minutes has gone by. Uh, and the first panelist is Yael from Olam. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. I prepared a, a short presentation. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for inviting me and for having me on a, on a Sunday evening. Um, my name is Yael and I am based in Washington DC but originally from Jerusalem. And I work for an organization called Olam. For the next few minutes I'll share a bit about my organization and then I was asked to share a bit about my own personal journey and um, experience in, in international development. And I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions. So I'll share about Olam, um, Olam's mission we are a network of over 60 Jewish and Israeli organizations that work in over 100 countries in the field of international development, humanitarian aid, and global volunteering. Um, Olam is inspired by Jewish values and is committed to high ethical standards. We convene and mobilize leaders and organizations to take meaningful action in support of the world's most vulnerable people. So what does that mean? What do we do? So I've been at Olam uh, for over four years and my title is Director of Network Engagement and Programs. So we have a large network and my role is to bring together Jewish and Israeli global service or volunteering, uh, international development and humanitarian aid practitioners from uh, these 60 partner organizations, but also Jews who work for non-Jewish organizations um, such as SD, um, and uh, others who work for the World Bank or USAID or other nonprofits. And we create programs to allow networking, learning, and pursuing ethical best practices. Um, Annie from Cadena is actually, uh, so Cadena is one of our 60 partner organizations and we've uh, worked together on different occasions. Um, so just an example of one of the programs that I'm leading right now, it's a program around um, kind of how to do your work in a more ethical way, because a lot of the work that we do in, inter in developing countries have consequences and could potentially cause harm, but also do really good and cause uh, or create great impact. So we're providing many um, tools, resources, and skills um, for our partners to develop these ethical practices in their work. So just for example, we um, kind of have sessions and, and tools around how do uh, our partners communicate their work better, their photos and the stories that they write about their work how do they do it in a way that, don't, that doesn't perpetuate stereotypes or promote kind of white savior with, saviorism, as we call it, and instead um, portrays people and communities uh, with dignity and resilience? So one part of our organization is working with these practitioners. The other side focuses on engaging Jewish leaders, Jewish funders, and other Jews by raising awareness about issues in the developing world, connecting them to the work of our partner organizations, and um, working to help embed global issues into their organizations, communities, synagogues, et cetera. Um, as an example, we're actually, I'm you know, excited to share this. We just uh, finished a week long campaign 
in which we're calling on the, the American Jewish community to support global vaccine equity um, by donating to UNICEF, which is the main global body that's leading the distribution of COVID vaccines to developing countries. So all of this past week, we reached out to Jewish influencers and leaders um, to donate to this campaign, but also share on social media so that the Jewish community can really be leading the weight in ending the pandemic. Um, if you're interested in taking part or learning more, I'll share um, some links in the chat later. Um, this is our logo, you know, maybe someone has seen it on social media, but we're really um, providing a chance for Jewish communities to be part of this global solution and pay it forward. Um, so that's uh, Olam, the organization. Um, a bit about my background. Uh, I have focused in my academic uh, programs, my master's degree, and in my uh, professional experience um, in the field of education and development. So that um, my specific focus is providing access to education for marginalized populations. So I've worked in different countries to develop programs that bring in or allow um, populations such as uh, children with disabilities, refugee children, street children, et cetera, to actually be able to get an education and get a quality education. Um, and I really have a strong belief, and I always have, that education is key to bring about progress and development um, and equality in the world, and you know, hopefully also eradicate extreme poverty. Um, so my regional focus has been Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I've lived and worked in six African countries and have traveled in many more. Um, it really started, my, my love of the, the region started with a study abroad program in my um, undergraduate degree at Boston University. I went to Niger, a French-speaking Muslim West African country um, in the Saharan Desert, and just fell in love with the culture, the people, the, um, just, just all about it, and have uh, you know, found ways to make myself back ever since. Um, in terms of Jewish and non-Jewish work, I for many years have had a professional world that looks at international development, but on the side, I was always seeking uh, Jewish communities and people who share uh, interest in social justice and um, you know just understand me as an Israeli as a Jew. But in the last uh, you know 10, 15 years, there have been more and more Jewish organizations and Israeli organizations that really combine both worlds. So throughout my career so far, I've had a mix of working with Jewish organization and also non-Jewish organizations. Um, Olam, where I am now, is a great example of a, a place that brings together really all of my interests and is able to um, to connect Jewish values with really important work around the world. So just very quickly, a few photos of some of the work I've done. On the left uh, is a program in India that I led um, or coordinated around letting um, children with disabilities into mainstream education because there has been you know, a history of parents who have a child with some sort of disability and they keep them basically locked up in the house, not really thinking that they have a future. Um, and there's been a big campaign in the last few years to really kind of bring the, these kids out and um, make sure they're getting um, the future they deserve. Uh, in the middle is when I was working in Ethiopia and we, uh, with a program that supports street children, and we brought a mobile school to an area that had children that weren't going to school, that were out in the streets begging for money, trying to find work. So you actually bring this school to them, bring some chalk and work with them on various different, um, you know, math and, you know, reading and all different things, very exciting. And on the right is a program in Rwanda um, that took children out of the child labor sector, um, specifically Rwanda's tea sector. Rwanda uh, exports a lot of tea and a lot of children, instead of going to school, are being put to work to support their families. So this was a great program that um, brought them from the fields to school. Okay, my last two slides, I was asked to share some challenges. So really quickly, um, an obvious one is just going and living in developing countries. There's a lot of cultural differences and um, some of them are, you know, fun to learn. Others are very, very embarrassing where you make a, you know, screw up in the way you're eating something or the way you sit or the way you shake your hand with the wrong hand and, um, you know, people stare at you and it's very uncomfortable, but also wonderful and also a great way to learn about yourself and your own traditions and culture and language. Um, I, I, you know, to be honest, like I've witnessed some behavior that I found troubling and it's a different in culture, um, whether it's, I'll give a, you know, a general um, 
like the behavior or the treatment of animals. I'm an animal lover, and in many countries, the animal welfare is not an issue. And you see, you know, people beating dogs and cats and and others. Um, so just being able to, or just seeing things that were that I wasn't used to, um, that's always been hard. Um, very quickly, being treated with different standards is sometimes very nice, but also can be really uncomfortable. Um, for example, when I was in Niger in West Africa. I was um, staying at a, a host family um, and basically every day the whole family would come together, the cousins and neighbors and sit on the floor and basically eat from one plate with their hands and sat there, you know, sharing that experience. And they basically would make me go sit at the table with a knife and fork and plate because they thought that what they know of, I guess, white people or people from the West is that that's what they want. And all I wanted to do was sit with them and just share the experience with them. And so sometimes different standards. Um, and you know, our, the way we look and the language we speak um, is sometimes, you know, uncomfortable and not what I would have wanted. Um, and then just, uh, this is a bigger conversation, but in retrospect, some of the challenges is, um, at the time, not understanding some of the bad practices, such as um, volunteering in, in orphanages is something that is very popular. A lot of people go to Africa to work with orphans. But as I learned, as I did my master's and learned, um, you know, the academic side and, and research around these issues, um, it's actually really harmful for people to come in without a psychology degree or without experience with very vulnerable children and come in and out of their lives and it can create a lot of harm. So looking back, um, I realized I've done a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have done. And I'll, I'll just finish quickly. Uh, I was asked to share a bit about my Jewish experience while um, working and living in, this, in developing countries. So the first thing is uh, there are Jews everywhere. I have landed in uh, the capital of Chad, also West Africa, and I go to the hotel and the first thing I hear is Hebrew. I'm like, what, really, how, how is that possible? And um, there are Israelis everywhere, Jews everywhere, and you can always find someone to, you know, even one person to celebrate a holiday with. Um, and there are of course countries that have very large uh, Jewish communities like Ethiopia. Um, so I mean, I, I was surprised, and you may be as well, but particularly in Africa, I've only found positive views of Israel, even in countries that are maybe more Muslim, um, that Israel does not have a great uh, relationship with, but Israel has done such good work in promoting good international development, particularly around agriculture and technology. And when people hear I'm from Israel, they're like, oh, that's amazing. We you know, have uh, grown these vegetables because of Israelis who came here and supported. So it's really been wonderful to, to hear that um, wherever I go. And I'll just finish with um, kind of an anecdote around, you, you may know from the Talmud, the, the poor of your town comes first, or and this is just a sentence that is thrown around a lot, uh, for better or worse, but people who still um, I meet and they just don't understand why a Jew should help someone across the world and when there's so many issues uh, close by. And that's a whole big conversation, but. I hope that today all of you will learn maybe that um, we're all one uh, neighborhood and town, regardless of uh, the borders. I think uh, that's time. So thank you so much. I'll pass it along. Thank you, Gail. We can really sense your passion and the smile that you had when you were talking about your work uh, in Africa was, you know, just inspiring. And I could relate to that because I have the same smile when I was like, and there is this kid that I worked with. <laughs> um, and I also really appreciate your self-reflection on harmful practices, because that's something that I think that um, Western uh, volunteers and, and um, employees in international development don't always give enough attention to. Uh, and so now I'd like to invite Annie to give her presentation. You're still muted, I think. Hold on. Yeah. You see my you screen or not? Uh, no. Is Annie a co-host? No. Can Can you give me? Now you are. Now you are. Now Now you can see it. Yes. Okay. So very nice to be here. I am, like Jael said, I really, really enjoy a lot the partnership and the help that we always get from Olam. It's really amazing how 
these organizations can be together and can have that support. So thank you, Yael, in advance for all what that you do. So um, a little bit also about my organization. Cadena is a humanitarian nonprofit organization that aids underprivileged countries when natural disaster strikes or a humanitarian crisis occurred. Uh, we have had many, many volunteers that um, try to contribute to devastated areas, which has in turn strengthened the Jewish communities and humanitarian people through a collective cause. We are all, we always go to, to any place of the world showing our keep our showing our a star of David in our shirt and we help everyone and we our first and most important principle for all, for us is tikkun olam so and um an interesting fact of our organization is that we not only um do these um missions where there is a natural disaster or a humanitarian crisis but we also um are focused a lot on educating children um mainly you know our jewish children from different communities around the world to tikkun olam for us it's so important to instill in them the humanitarian seed so they can be the humanitarians in the future we do programs in schools we go and we teach them in how important it is to research about different situations like yael said kids that are you know sometimes in the u.s and have never traveled or have never really seen uh, such horrific situations that there are in other countries like Africa, like Latin America. We try, we ask them to research about this and they research and they have to come up with ideas and they have to, to look for a solution for these ideas. And then Cadena tries to, uh, uh, the, the winning idea or the idea that, that we, think it would really fit to with our with our organization we try to make it a reality so we can use it in our humanitarian um, missions so this is something we do as well as all the other um situations i was asked to talk about a little bit about the different missions or the most recent missions we have so we we work a lot on uh, the migrant situation the terrible migrant situation in the venezuelan people that are having to leave Venezuela walking and they go walking to different countries until they find um, you know a, a way to to leave and we are in Colombia and we have now opened a hospital for women to help them give birth we give medical consultation psychology um, con consults as well and um, we we try to to and why women because there was we discovered after our research that there were many, many women that were unattended, that they were even walking pregnant. And so we decided to do this. Um, it's very important also for us to, to explain a little bit that we don't, you know, we never go, we give the help ourselves. We, we give the help directly to the people in need. We never, you know, leave it to the government for them to give it, but we ourselves, travel to the country and we give the help. We also had, uh, unfortunately, many situations already this year. In Malawi, there was um, a cyclone, so we went there. We gave medical consultations, psychological consultations as well. Uh, water filters, that is something that we use a lot and we teach the communities how to use them so they can last for a long, long time in their in their community. And we also have, um, we also went to Ecuador, which it, there was um, a landslides because of a, a very heavy rain situation. And we also there um, gave water filters because there were many contaminated water. Um, Haiti is something, of course, there's so many um, natural disasters there. And we are always, you know, seeking to help uh, these underprivileged communities um many times we've been there every time there is a, a earthquake or a hurricane there we are there for for them um, i also want to talk a little bit about my background before uh, being uh, i am also an educator uh, i study education in venezuela i then came here to the states uh, to miami actually i, I live in miami 
and my uh, also my master was in, in curriculum design. So that's why I'm designing all these programs for children to learn about what is to be a humanitarian. We are now launching an, um, an online course about being a humanitarian for middle school children and the children are, we, our intention is for every children to uh, be able to work with this program and, and to, to enjoy and have the opportunity uh, to use it so they can learn to be humanitarians. Um, a little bit about challenges, different challenges that we, we've overcome or we have seen during our missions is always, you know, when we go to a mission, we always have to do like a, a research, we always have to assess the situation. But sometimes when you go there, before, after, you know, all your research, sometimes you have to put the principle of humanity first. Sometimes there's many things that you think they really need, but when you're there and you realize there's other needs, you have to put those first because um, you have to be inclusive to everyone in the community, no matter their ideology, what are their needs, the culture, so this is sometimes, you know, a struggle during during our our missions. Also, security and safety of our volunteers. We always, you know, have to be first know about if the place is secure, if they are, it's going to be safe for our volunteers. That's why we send a team beforehand so they can assess the situation and know where to really, you know, be. Also, COVID-19 has been a struggle for us, how to travel, the different regulations during um, COVID-19 that we have to, to, to assess beforehand. So, you know, our volunteers are not, you know, in risk of getting COVID or, or, or getting, being stuck in a country for some reason. Also, Poverty, language barriers, as um, Yael says, always cultural barriers could be a challenge. It's very interesting to see how people from all over the world um, can communicate, but things like taking a group of psychologists, but not knowing the language of where you are, that could be a big, big challenge. So you have to always, you know, research about the community, assess, and then go so that's something important i wanted to add and so what was my motivation i was always working in nonprofit organizations i uh, for me my my family uh, living in venezuela my my grandmother created an an under uh, an ngo in venezuela to generate awareness about jewish um, people in venezuela and how we can all coexist. And she, she really inspired me to do what I'm doing now. So this is like, what was my motivation? Also, I am an educator. So for me, so I think that children are the future. And if we teach children how to be humanitarian, we are gonna have a better, better world uh, in future generations. Uh, well, challenging. Funding, of course, is always a challenge because we work on a time sensitive um, basis. So when there's a natural disaster, we just go. We don't think about, you know, if we're gonna be able to, to afford it. And then we have to start very quickly the fundraising and all of this. So this is always very challenging to, to, to be able to go in an emergency anywhere and get half the amount or the right funding for it, for it. It's always a challenge. And I think this is in every NGO, the same situation. Um, as I said also different languages, it is challenging to be, to find interpreters for the psychologists, for, for when you go to Africa or you go to uh, a Latin American country, you have to find the right people to be in that mission so that you can communicate. Um, and and uh, as I said before, Cadena does risk assessments prior the response so we can mitigate the challenges once we are there. So what happens for us it is super important to continue um, the Jewish traditions, even if we are in a mission, we do Shabbat, that's for sure, always 
we uh, uh, make sure to bring the appropriate food for all of our volunteers. Um, no matter where we are, we allow time for prayers. Um, and well, Cadena has many, many um, good relationships with different NGOs that are in Israel and with the Israeli army. We have been in many missions working together with them. Um, the last mission we were um, was here in Miami when the buildings collapsed. Uh, Cadena was one of the first NGOs that that it's non-American and non-good government and non from the government of, of Florida that was able to enter and help during that uh, incident. So for us to be with the Israeli Defense Force, force right there was incredible and was a, a huge um, a nice thing to see how Jewish can connect from all around the world. And well, this is this is it. I don't think I I passed the time or all right. Thank you, Annie. I really appreciated the backstory of how you got to do the work in Venezuela and the need that exists there, as well as the challenges of of having to fundraise and project plan at the same time. I think that I've never really thought about the logistics of that when it comes to disaster relief. Yeah, that is very challenging. Um, okay, so I will present now. There is a question for you in the chat, Annie, so maybe you could answer it via the chat. Uh, yes. Um, and I will go ahead and start my presentation. Um, I do have a few slides as well, but I was thinking how I could start in an engaging way, and I decided that I will tell a story about what happened to me about two weeks ago when I was in Paraguay. I'm back in the US now, but I was in Paraguay for three weeks on a visit. I was in a fancy hotel in the capital uh, where I work for Facebook now, and I was going to park there for the day and just work remotely from this fancy hotel. I came down the stairs at 7.45 AM, um, stopped at the bottom of the stairs to talk to the receptionist, when suddenly we heard somebody getting beaten upstairs. Like we were hearing like screams and somebody getting beaten. And the receptionist was like, oh, is he hitting her? And I was like, I think so. And he, and she called the room and immediately we heard just silence. And then, she, and then um, Marisa, who the receptionist is actually like somebody who I've known for a while because I stay in that hotel quite frequently. So Marisa went like running up the stairs and I was like, I can't let her go by herself. Right. So I go running up after her. We're, we're knocking on the door of this room where something's happening. And we basically have to intervene in this, in this case of domestic violence, where like, we're taking the woman out of the situation, putting her in her own room that situation morphed into realizing that the woman was afraid, was hiding from the police because she's from a political family. She's a wealthy woman from a political family and they had stolen $500,000 from the government. And she was afraid that we were going to call the police, which led into us calling the police anyway, which led to the police completely not wanting to take the case, not knowing what to do because they don't have the right training or education. I think like, I mean, my, there's issues with critical, there's issues with literacy um, in this country, uh, which, led, uh, which led into me and a few of the hotel staff basically problem solving together to micromanage the police case. And that was my two hours before starting work for, for Facebook that morning. Um, the reason why I'm bringing that case up is because the reason why I'm involved in Paraguay is because, um, is because I'm so angry <laughs> at all of the things that situations like that represent. Like I get so angry that there is so much blatant domestic violence in your face, community violence that we all see every day and that we all know about. 
I got so angry about the corruption and I don't blame people. I blame processes. I get so angry that there are not better processes that hold people in power accountable to people who don't have power. And then I get so angry that there is no education system set up that processes work for the people. So social, social services, police, the hospitals, the health system, right? All those services are extremely broken. And a lot of that is because of education. Um, and in the meantime, right, it's, I feel like in, it's very rare for me in the US to feel so angry about something, but also feel like I have a lot of power to do something about it. Where it is, whereas when I'm in Paraguay, um, because of low cost, it just seems to me like a lot, a, a lot of fixes are not that they're easy, but that you have the potential to create really big impact with a few steps. Um, <laughs> so anyways, I'm going to show my presentation um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I went about starting a nonprofit in Paraguay. Okay, um, so I actually started the, I started uh, my involvement in Paraguay in the Peace Corps. Um, Paraguay is down here in South America, right above Argentina. I did not choose to go to Paraguay. I actually, 10 years ago, requested to go to Africa. The Peace Corps told me that I couldn't choose what country that I would be placed in. Um, I said, fine, <laughs> and they placed me in Paraguay. Um, little did I know would be that I would be involved in that country for, you know, 10 years and beyond probably my whole life. This is me in the Peace Corps in my house. I lived in a, a wooden house with a latrine. I bought a pig as a pet. Uh, his name was Christopher. <laughs> my host family, these kids actually ate him like the second I left in 2014, <laughs> which we still joke about. I still joke about that with them because that pig was not fully grown yet. And I think that he had another like six months to a year left of life before he was ready to be killed. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that's Fatima and that's Jessica. And this is us eight years later, a few years ago, Fatima and Jessica and me again. Um, and I'm still very, very close with these kids. When I was back in Paraguay, um, I, I stayed with their family and they're like my family. Um, in the Peace Corps, so the Peace Corps, um, I would say is about 5, 10 to 15% Jewish. I think a lot of Jewish people feel a sense of responsibility to doing something uh, with our pri privilege and, you know, fixing the world. Um, and, and we also feel at home in education. Um, I think Jewish people are experts and are often experts in education, especially in informal education. And the Peace Corps is a place where we're essentially trainers um, and you are sent to a community paired with an organization that has requested you and whatever your field of expertise, be it business, agriculture, education itself, or health, right? You are training the community in some way for two years, trying to set up um, some kind of sustainable program. And in my case, I was actually a, Principally, I was a business volunteer working in micro-entrepreneurship and computers. Um, I taught about 150 people in my community how to use a computer for the first time in their lives, from like turning it on to how to use a mouse, <laughs> what Microsoft Word is, like from the beginning, um, how to Google something. <laughs> um, and then... Yeah, and then, but I think the thing I was proudest about in the Peace Corps was starting a girls group um, because I was getting increasingly angry about the domestic violence incidents that I saw around me. Um, I, when I left the Peace Corps, I had a feeling like I didn't do enough. I had a feeling like some of the kids, some of the kids, like the kids you're seeing on the screen right now, they come, they come from a low income but stable family, but I also worked with a lot of kids who came from very unstable families that were experiencing hunger, that were experiencing violence, um, or, or just kids who were, you know, in situations of complete neglect. And it's really hard to be, you know, the most important in a kid, person in a kid's life and then just leave them, right, with nobody to replace you. 
Um, and I felt like I had to do something more because I could. Um, and four years later, I went back to Paraguay with only $12,000 of funding. Uh, for a reference, the minimum wage for a year in Paraguay is about $4,000. So $12,000, um, in my mind, it, I was very much on the fence because I, was, I wanted to start an organization. $12,000 is nothing, but I was struggling to fundraise more at, in the moment <laughs> without a proof of concept. Um, but when I got down there to visit, I, I, you know, was slapped in the face again with the need that I, that I saw and also, but also given hope that doing something big in the developing world doesn't require that much funding. And I ended up hiring five people, part, um, five people, mostly, mostly uh, full-time for eight months with the, with the little money I had. <laughs> and I decided to go ahead, hire eight people, start an organization, no office, no problem, like, and just start the organization and prove that we, you know, were successful and then go back and, uh, and raise money and make the organization bigger. Uh, so the organization is called Super Ninos. Our mission is to mobilize children as agents of change as well. We have, um, right now we have 10 full-time employees and 23 people on uh, between two board, boards of directors in Asuncion, the cap in, uh, in Paraguay and in the US. Um, we have two offices in the, the town of Coronel Oviedo where I did the Peace Corps and in the capital. And we have five programs. We have a program called Kid Teachers where children volunteer teaching literacy to other kids. Uh, not just how to how to read the letters of the alphabet, but also reading comprehension, which currently isn't being taught in schools, um, and which you know people like a police officer need to know in order to fully understand the law or understand how to write a police report. Um, then there's uh, girls leadership programs through an organization called Glow. We have a hundred girls in girls empowerment groups. Um, I recently, when I was back down in Paraguay, I sat in some of the sessions uh, where girls were anonymously sharing their problems, uh, which were all very relatable to me. You know, things like, I feel like people judge me for how I look. Um, I work too much. I, cr I can't stop crying, you know, like were the types of things that they wrote on pieces of paper and we would pick them out of the hat, read them out loud and then help the girls with their problems in an anonymous way, um, which is a really, really important community support group given the lack of, of services like therapy or, or, um, or psychology in the community. Um, and it, it's kind of like a form of, of group mentorship for them. And then we have uh, 40 high schoolers who are involved in our volunteer program, uh, mostly fundraising, but also working with the, with the kids. Then we have a life skills program, um, which this year we think is going to be focused. We, fo we change the theme every year. This year, we're going to focus on teaching 3,000 children and youth about um, civic action and the ways that they can hold government officials accountable. And then during COVID, we actually had a, a, a TV show that's similar to Sesame Street that we started. Um, which is for teaching. It was a way to get kids involved in something powerful in a virtual format. And I, I can show you what it looks like in a little bit. Uh, Jewish experiences, um, I put challenges. Applying to the Peace Corps was actually really, really challenging for me as an Orthodox Jew um, from college. Um, I, I expressed that you know, I'm totally okay going wherever, but I will not be eating kosher, not kosher meat. And, and I, you know, will be keeping Shabbat. And the Peace Corps almost didn't accept me because of that, because they saw that as me being unwilling to integrate in the community. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if the Peace Corps is still like that. I hope that they're not. I gave them that feedback when they did surveys for us once we were in the program. <laughs> and they did, they did accept me in the program because we pushed back quite a bit about um, about legal action. So I, I did get into the Peace Corps and but once I got there, um, Paraguayans were so accommodating that I had nothing to do to worry about. Like anything you need, they're just glad that you came to the country. 
Um, and the truth is that I think that, I think the Peace Corps itself, like, was just looking at a checklist, like, are you going to be successful if, like, well, if you don't eat with the people, you're not going to be successful. <laughs> um, but in my case, I don't have to eat with, I don't, I can drink tea with the people. I would drink the tea called terere, which is a form of mate for those of you who know it. And to me, like, drinking terere with the people <laughs> plus being good with kids was a stronger recipe to fitting into the community than, you know, sitting down and eating a stew with them. Uh, and then, yeah, worry, I put worrying about Nazis uh, as a challenge for me because there are, there are pockets of, you know, Germans who escaped uh, after World War II who ended up in Paraguay. Uh, and they're, but, but that never affected me. It was just something I had heard about beforehand um, and which I think heading into Paraguay made me, made me worried. <laughs> but I think the, the, the Paraguayans and the locals would, like, would, never, would never tolerate any like hate situation like that. And the only reason why I think pockets of like ex-Nazis could exist is because they're so remote that they don't talk to anybody else. Like they're in the middle of, you know, a very, very rural area and are self-contained. Um, and I personally also had trouble plugging into the Jewish community in Asuncion. I found it a little closed. Um, but I was able to form a Jewish community within the Peace Corps that, that um, and I was able to celebrate Shabbat and do Shabbat meals with uh, Jewish uh, Peace Corps volunteers who were in my region of Paraguay. And we did national Jewish, um, Jewish get togethers for all of the major holidays. And it was also always really nice to include Paraguayans in those traditions. Towards the tail end, I started inviting more and more of my, my Paraguayan family members to my Passover seders or to Rosh Hashanah dinner. And that became um, a really meaningful way for us to do a cultural exchange because I would attend their, you know, their Paraguayan traditions. And then in exchange, I could, I could also invite them to, to my Jewish traditions. Um, let's see. I also have a slide on challenges which I'll skip to, um, <laughs> challenges. And it's interesting because I'm nodding at all of the challenges that Yael and Annie mentioned. I think that they're very similar across the board. I put funding as number one as well. Hiring qualified staff, I think Annie also mentioned that hiring, hiring staff in, in countries um, which, with, which struggle with education is difficult. And I had to give my staff a lot, a lot of training in order to get them where they, where they are right now. Uh, and it, it's, it remains difficult. Um, looking for a new director for us after I left took, I don't, maybe six, more than six months to find, a, to find a new director after, and we interviewed and considered maybe 80 candidates. <laughs> Um, creating a culture of high performance in a, in a world where, where, you know, everything that it has a social mission is not, is not high performance <laughs> is difficult, you know, where, where, you know, you walk into a government building or in a hospital and people are just sitting there on their cell phones, not doing their job um, and telling people that our organization is not like that. And our organization is going to, to operate more of like a business where you come and you do your job and you're right. And, and explaining to them that we're here because we have a mission, right? And to us, wasted time counts as fraud. That, that's how I would explain it to people, but it still took up quite a bit of effort to, in, to make that part of our culture and not just Estes rules. <laughs> um, and then I'm just gonna do one more because I know I'm out of time. Navigating bureaucracy um, has been the biggest issue <laughs> and the bane of my existence for the last, probably my fiance um, knows that I get so frustrated. We've been trying to send money to a Paraguayan bank account since October. And it took us a four or five months to get that money transfer unblocked um, because due to actually US pressure, um, developing countries 
will will um, instate very, very strict rules. In this case, it was about money laundering. <laughs> um, and because the rule because they are under such scrutiny about money laundering and accepting money from overseas from from first world bank accounts, it's often easier for the banks to just not accept bank transfers anymore because it's such an exception case and they don't want to deal with what if this is money laundering? What if it's corruption? They don't know where the money from the Super Kids Foundation in the US came from. What did the donors do? Did the donors get the money from corruption? And it's just so much work, so much of a headache for them that it's easier for them to just stop accepting it. Um, and we've and 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 we've been needing to uh, work on, you know, calling the banks, being on the phone with customer service, go in person. Oh, you need to get a signed document. Oh, we don't accept that signed document because you also need this type of document. We've just been having that back and forth um, for a very long time. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking about Super Ninos. Um, and I'll go into, I'll maybe I'll read like two of the questions off the list and then give everybody a chance to, <laughs> and then give everybody a chance to answer more questions. Uh, so if anybody has any more questions, I see a few questions in the chat. Um, feel free to start writing your questions in the chat and I'll ask the panelists, um, I'll ask the panelists, I think what, what is a primary question for a lot of people here, which is why do you think that Jewish people should be involved in international development? And maybe Yael, you can go first since that, that's kind of like, that's Olam's mission. Yes, it is. Um... It's our mission, but it's also kind of a hard thing to articulate just because it's something that came so naturally to me as a Jew, someone who grew up with Jewish values of tikkun olam. It's, you know, it, it just, it's an obvious thing to want to help those most in need. But, um, you know, it, it really comes from just our, um, just the experiences that we have whether it's from you know us being Jewish people being refugees and knowing what it's like to be uh, unwanted and to be fleeing, seeing people who are going through that the same when we talk about never forget and you know never repeat history, we have the opportunity to actually help those who are you know fleeing violence, who are living in poverty, who are experiencing you know disasters, etc. Um, so of course Tikkun Olam is a huge value that every life has, um, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm all the, the Jewish phrases are now mixing up in my head, but, you know, Tzelem Elohim, that every person is a world within itself. Um, and there are people who just have so much need and the world has resources and we have the resources and the education and the ability. Um, it's just, you know, from my experience or from my uh, personal point of view, uh, we don't have an excuse not to help those across the world. And I'll just say particularly, you know, you could also help people within your own, you know, even non-Jews in your neighborhood, in your community. There's, of course, so many people to help. But I think um, COVID has really made us all see that um, borders really don't mean anything. That what happens in one part of the world, in, in South Africa, in Vietnam, in Paraguay, is going to affect us, and particularly around you know, now with COVID vaccines, the fact that my parents in Jerusalem have gotten their fourth dose, but only 10% of, um, of Africa has gotten vaccinated. That's just going to come right back to us because we're going to continue having a pandemic unless we help. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Annie, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, well, of course, I agree with Yael. Um, for us, is our responsibility. You know, it's a uh, it's something we must do. It's something that we should teach our children to do. And um, repairing the world is something that you cannot overlook what is happening in, in the world. And uh, I, our founder, which lives in Mexico, because we started the organization Cadena started in Mexico, always said that he likes to wear a kippa to everywhere he goes, even though he doesn't usually wear a kippa because he likes to, you know, most of people have this stigma that Jews only help Jews, that Jews only help within their synagogue, within 
their people, their family. So being able to recognize that there's so many things happening in the world, that there's a lot of suffering and that it's our duty to help others. And uh, we are in a privileged, privileged position. That is something that we really, really need to instill in society. For me, it's about lack of resources. And, and I went to Paraguay originally, I think, with the Peace Corps because I was interested in seeing what most of the world is like. <laughs> you know, it, you know, just take me to a place so differently from how I grew up and see like what is the world like? What how do most people live? And really, so that you, I could really kind of like finish my education, right? Like you can't really understand what, what the world is like just by reading a textbook, right? You have to go there and understand it. Um, and then for me, once I got there, um, just the fact, the lack of resources made me realize that I have a duty to do something because in, in my town in Paraguay, there is no other nonprofit for children, right? And for me, it was like, I can support a nonprofit that already exists somewhere else. I can. And uh, there are a lot of nonprofits in the world that need more funding, but, but I'm seeing kids who do not have any camp, right? They do not have any tutors. They do not have mentors. They don't have social workers. They don't have any resources, right? And that doesn't mean that they're living miserably, right? A lot of them are happy, but they, but they have problems like all of us, right? They have, um, and, and they just don't have the same opportunities that you find in other places. And I realized that I very easily with, you know, with our budget has been until this year, our budget was uh, since for the, I think the first three years of our existence, only $40,000. If we were able to have eight staff with $40,000 for the last a year for the last three years. Um, and you're able to really, really be the most important thing in a lot of kids life. And it's not to me, it's not it's not about whether I'm related to them, or if we have the same ancestry or religion, right? It's about caring about kids, because kids are kids are kids everywhere. Um, I see a question in the chat. I'm not sure if it's only for me or for everybody, um, but do you think that Jewish communities in the U.S. appreciate your work? I can answer first. <laughs> I can answer first. I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm interested to hear what Annie and Yael feel, but I think that I my experience is that I've met individuals who are very interested in international development, but most people plugged into Jewish communities don't understand it, I would say. It's not necessarily that they're not interested or that they think it's a bad thing, but I think that they, they don't understand why you would do something that's off the beaten path and why, <laughs> and why you wouldn't want to be comfortable. Uh, yeah, you looked like you wanted to say something. Well, I'll just say that, yeah, not everyone should go into this field of work. You know, I think all of us also have a love of travel and it's such a great perk that you get to see the world and meet people, different cultures. And there's so many things that, um, you know, you need a bit of an adventurous side to have this profession. So in that sense, I understand why some people wouldn't, you know, really like understand why we would do this. But in terms of, I think the main thing that we work with at Olam, where we're working with Jewish communal organizations, the Hillels, the federations, the Moisha, House, Moisha houses, et cetera, who you know, really have the values of tikkun olam and they understand wanting to dedicate your life to doing things, but there's so many competing um, things. And, and it's really hard for us to be able to convince them why global is necessarily more important when it's not, that's the problem. It's, we should be giving to all of these, but it's just not, not possible. Um, so just for example, last year, we created a, a large um, online campaign around the refugee crisis, around 80 million refugees around the world, the peak number of refugees since World War II. And we really wanted the Jewish community and all these you know, organizations to really just um, learn about it and you know, donate and take action and volunteer, et cetera. 
but at that same week, I think that was the week that, um, I mean, of course it was COVID, but also um, uh, George Floyd, the situation, all the, you know, Black Lives Matter. And there was so many things going on that, you know, 80 million refugee topic was just pushed aside, which again, I understand. Um, so it's just, it's hard to get the attention um, because of so many other pressing issues these days. But I will say, we're glad to see that people care about anything, honestly. Um, maybe today it's gonna be about what's happening in your own town. And then, you know, next year it'll, it'll be about something around the world, so, yeah. Yeah, and for me, um, I grew up in an underprivileged country. I grew up in Venezuela. So for me, I, I you know, I used to go in my car. I, I was in a, in a nice house. I was the lucky one in that situation, but I would see, you know, around me, a lot of suffering, a lot of, you know, what, what was really happening. Um, and I was, always was worried and aware about that. But, and I'm talking about an educator's perspective that when I got here and even my kids, because I have kids that are American, um, it, when I go to school sometimes to explain the situation, it's so hard for them sometimes to relate because like Essie said, she needed to travel to really see what was happening and to understand. Here, most of the kids, it's hard for them to really understand what's happening if they're not, they don't have it in front of them. They don't. So I think that sometimes when you go and show these programs, not even when I go to the principals of the school and explain to them the importance of this, sometimes they don't even really understand why this should be more important than math. Or the or the English or learning, you know, science. But you know, others really get it. But it's a struggle because there are so many things, and you know, there's a competitive. Um, they have to meet some expectations, a curriculum, etc. That sometimes it's hard for them to understand how important it is to learn about the underdevelopment world, or how important it is to work in this in this area. So yes, it is a challenge here in the States, in local Jewish communities to, to you know, help them understand that this is also something important and that we should all, you know, instill this in our, in our youth, in our children. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Annie and Yael. I want to, I want to end on a positive note. So, uh, Annie and Yael, do you have any like words of encouragement or recommendations for for people who want to get more involved? Well, I'm going to shamelessly plug <laughs> Olam. Um, again, Olam represents uh, 60 Jewish and Israeli organizations doing amazing work around the world. So if you get our newsletter, I, I posted the, I can do it again. Um, it's olamtogether.org. Um, it's a really great way to see, you know, if you're interested in education, agriculture, disaster relief, uh, health, COVID response, we have, you know, any and all topics that our partner organizations cover. Um, and the nice, the nice thing is that it's very easy to sit in your comfortable home and donate online. And a lot of times what people need is, is funds to get this really, really important work done. Um, so that's a, a way for you to easily get involved. <laughs> Yes, and, and for, for me, I agree, Olam is a great way to get involved, as well as if you would like to, you know, have your children, your, your grandchildren involved in humanitarian action and learn more about this, reach out to, to me, I'm going to share my um, website, but also, you, you know, your, your kids' school, if they would be interested in this kind of program, we are, you know, we, we offer these programs completely free, not, not cost, and it's a great way for them to get more involved and more, more interested in these so important issues. My words of recommendation, I, I shared my website and my email address in case anyone's interested in sponsoring a child with us um, on the ground in Paraguay. Um, but I think that if you know anybody who is interested in being involved in the developing world and might have the, the adventure spirit, but is like too scared to take that step, I'd definitely be willing to 
give them some tips or words of encouragement. Um, Israelis are traveling the world all of the time out, like going to the develop, developing countries. And I think that that's why there are so many Israeli organizations involved in international development, because you go, you see, you get angry, you get passionate, you see, you see the need and you see how, how easy it could be to make a difference. Um, in my experience, my, my American peers are, are not as likely to take that step to go see, to go see um, the, you know, developing country, countries firsthand. Um, but if anybody, if you know anybody who might be interested in traveling and getting to know a community, getting to, to know um, a language or culture that's very different and, and treat it like a learning experience, um, definitely um, you could connect us and I'd be happy to, to give them some tips about how to start their, how to start their learning experience. All right, and with that, I think that we're over time. Uh, so I think I'll ask everybody to, um, everybody in the chat, if you feel comfortable, um, maybe just like write down the, 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 one of the takeaways that you took from this panel and then we can, we can all sign off. Thank you for attending on a Sunday and uh, thank you to Annie and Yael for, for attending on a Sunday as well and sharing your experience in international development. I know I learned a lot um, and I will also be writing my takeaway in the chat right now. Thank you right. for having us. Of course. Thank you. <laughs>